Chapter 40 Attack on Von Aborus Two figures set out from Gerudo Town an hour before dawn. They rode south to look up posts, and there they waited. Two hours after dawn, a crowd gathered at the walls of the town, voices raising from a soft memory to a steady, insistent hum. There was a wave of shouting, of adulation, and at the head of that wave walked Wiju, the chief of the Gerudo, young and small but resplendent with the thunder helm fastened securely onto her head. She rode out, hauled across the sands by her faithful seal, Patricia, and many were those who looked after her with the real, genuine hope of people who had been searching for something to hope for for a long, long time. The Iga were gone. Ganon stirred, but the chief had the thunder helm, and was riding out to tame the wild divine beast, so it might be aimed at the enemy of the people. There were those who wondered if someone so small, someone so young, could possibly do the things that were being set before her, but those voices were admonished by their sisters and aunts and mothers. All they could do was believe. Believe and wait. So they waited, as Rija rode south. Is there any word from Sedri? Zelda asked. Hyatt looked up from her place on the bench. The two of them had been sitting in the mostly quiet for a long time, and ever since dawn Sudri had been standing on the observation balcony, watching the divine beast. The sound of the storm around the divine beast von Aborus, the crash of lightning, rattled a small building as if it might be blown over, but Sudri was undisturbed. She looked like one of the statues of the seven, powerful and utterly implacable. It does not appear so, Hyatt said. Zelda, on the other side of the room, nodded. It wasn't a response that left much room for a follow-up. She wished it did, she wanted to do a follow-up, to talk more about. Anything really. But she needed an opening, and she didn't really have one. She had thought that they would have a conversation in the morning, that Paya would have questions or demands or assurances or any number of things, but there had been nothing. The shaker woman had gotten up and begun to dress, prepping herself in her normal traveling gear. Sada had spent a few minutes thinking that Paya would walk out the door, then, that she would begin to walk back to Kakariko village without even asking to use the shaker slate's teleportation, but in the end the other woman had come with her to the sand seal render. To Zelda's great relief they were given the same individuals that had carted them to the Yiga clan hideout, they had apparently scurried home at all speed as soon as the gram began to shake, and set out together. Still no word spoken, save for those small exchanges that were utterly necessary. A few checks for mutual readiness, but nothing that approached an actual conversation. Well, I need a conversation. Am I to just sit here and stew in my own thoughts? Drive myself mad with anxiety? It can be remedied. She raised her head, determined to bridge the gap between the two of them. The silence was loud, though, and the thunder aided it. Kyle looked over her shoulder, at the window, and watched the light dancing in the sand. Von Aberis roared, restless. Not the moment she wanted, then. Then Pia turned, made eye contact with Zelda, and seemingly realized she was making eye contact before focusing very hard on her knees. Oh, enough of this. It seems obvious, since we are here, Zelda said. But I can't help wondering where you stand, regarding our conversation yesterday. Pia mumbled something, which was lost in the noise outside, raised her eyes, realized she hadn't been heard, and then raised her voice. I had a lot of time to think, in the infirmary. Selda nodded. It feels like I've spent most of this journey. She stopped, flushed, then visibly struggled before deciding to continue. There aren't really any secrets between us anymore, are there? The princess thought for a long second. I don't think so, no. If there are, I'm not keeping them intentionally. Nor am I. So? So there's no reason for me not to tell you how afraid I've been. How hesitant I felt. How unworthy to stand beside you. Pia couldn't maintain eye contact while she was saying this, but she kept talking, which was a world removed from how far she'd been able to take these conversations in the past. Zelda was actually in awe of her. She thought back to the young woman who she had left Kakariko village with. How long had they been traveling together? Only a couple of months, surely. And in that time Pai had changed a great deal. Do you remember when you finished recovering part of your memory and sat with me and Mepha in the shade, after? That's what we'd been talking about. How a regular person could possibly help someone like you. She felt herself scowling, didn't try to hide it. 
I know I can hardly claim to be a regular person with everything that's happened, but... Paya shook her head, and Zelda fell quiet. The point is more that you're... You... You're one of three players in a cycle that is nearly as eternal as the world itself. There have been figures who could aid the hero and the goddess in the past, but they were all people of legendary goodness and strength. It's impossible to measure up to those legends. She looked up, almost shy. Except in your case, I suppose. Selda tried not to let her impatience show. She might have failed. Kyle, you know that I don't judge you against the standards of mythology. I know. But I do, because you are that mythology. She let that hang between them. I wondered, after you left to talk with Chief Riju, what it would mean for me to return to Kakariko village. I realized I was not afraid of the shame of returning alone, or even of having to explain everything to my grandmother. On some level I think it was expected that I would return at some point before the journey reached its end, certainly once the ego were neutralized. I wasn't afraid of how people would look at me, or being alone, or... or any of the things I would have been afraid of before we traveled together. She swallowed, visibly gathering up her courage. I was afraid of. Zelda and Paya both jumped to their feet as the door swung open with a crash. Sorry. Rija said from the threshold, looking as sheepish as was reasonably possible with the thunder helm covering most of her face. Didn't expect the wind to blow the door open like that. The wind, in fact, was so strong that Rija couldn't force the door shut on her own. Zelda rose and helped her push it closed. The light of morning in the building was dim, mostly blotted out by the sandstorm. Even in that low light Riju's helmet seemed to glow, humming with promise and power. Zelda could not help wondering at what magics had been tied into it, how much history and power it actually represented. Riju was grumbling as she unfastened the strap that held it in place under her chin. Really should have tried to get some padding. Suddery. For the first time that morning the guard turned from her post and stepped inside, snapping off a very smart salute. Yes, Chief Riju. Riju tried to hold the thunder helm under one arm, found it was too big, and decided just to hold it with both hands. What is the status of Von Aboris? Sudri held her arms behind her back, staring not at Riju but at the far wall. The divine beast has, for the past few days, been keeping to its usual wandering patterns. There have been variations, but they are well within observed variant ranges. Zelda turned this over in her head, then started when she realized the pair were speaking in Hylian. Probably for our benefit. However, within the past two hours, his course has been listing. Naboris is currently headed away from the outpost, but it is also turning at maximum speed. I estimate that when it comes about, it will head directly for this spot. Within the past two hours, Riju shook her head. It would seem that the enemy has better sensory capabilities than we'd given it credit for. That made Sudra look down at her chief, eyebrows raised. For a moment it seemed she would ask for clarification, but in the end she did not. Rija set her mouth in a line, rubbed at her brow with her fingertips, and thought for a moment. All right. How long before Von Avaris is bearing lines up with our location? The Divine Beast will face us directly within the next 15 minutes. It will reach us in another five or so, assuming that it is trying to do so. Rest assured that it is, Rija said, putting the thunder helm back on and fastening the strap once more. However, it will not reach here. We will distract it and, if at all possible, we will stop it. I don't expect you will need to do so, but be prepared to flee if it comes within 90 seconds of this building. Do you understand? Sadri did not respond, save by saluting again. Riju motioned for Zelda and Paya to follow her, and barely managed to catch the door before it slammed open once more. She let it go when it was too far along to do much more than make a sizable bang. Sadri, get the door for me. Of course, Chief Riju. Riju, Zelda, and Paya stepped out into the storm. Zelda pulled her wrap over her nose, and Paya cleared her throat before putting on her stealth mask. Rija seemed utterly unbothered by the weather, but very bothered by circumstance. She stepped over to her seal, rested one hand on its flank, and bent over as if the weight of the thunder helm is pulling her toward the ground. Zelda and Paya exchanged a glance, and through an unspoken agreement Zelda was the one to approach the younger woman. She thought about putting her hand on Rija's shoulder, then restrained herself, folding both of her hands in front of her. Are you all right? 
Weiji took a moment to respond. This is real, isn't it? Velda blinked. Weiji sounded genuinely afraid, in a way she hadn't expected or even allowed space for in her mind. Are you all right? The chief shook her head. I thought I was. When I went out to scout Von Everest, I was. No. No. No, I'm not. We are running out of time. Do you want to talk about it? Not really. Pai cut in. It can help. Read you from, but the shake only nodded in return. I promise. Just for a moment. A moment's hesitation. Zelda could see the forces warring inside of Riju, the need to be a strong leader, the need to maintain that posture versus strangers, and the crushing reality of being 14 years old while carrying the fate of an entire people very literally on her shoulders. When I last went near Von Aboris, I thought of it as a malfunctioning machine. Its attacks felt automatic, without direction. The thunder helm protected me, and watching the lightning bolts break and spread around me made me feel so... powerful. It made me feel connected. Like I could do what was needed of me. Like I could do anything. But looking at it now, I can't see a machine that is behaving randomly. Do you know what I see? Sada spoke the word. Anin. We're on them. The wind seemed quieter. We do never looked up. Yes. Enemy of the people. Do you know the story that, once, Ganon took on the shape of a Gerudo? We've had its stigma attached to us since time immemorial. With each of its appearances we wage war to erase that shame. We are supposed to hate Ganon more than we fear it. She was stroking Patricia's pelt. Ah, oh, but I can't. Not after yesterday, when it showed the world what it's actually capable of. Now she looked up, fixing her eyes on Zelda. And it's more than that, isn't it? Reports say that there were monsters like Ganon itself on the Divine Beasts. That they attacked you when you tried to free the spirits of the champions. That in each case, they nearly killed you. Selda hesitated before responding. Everything that Riju had just said was true, but there was more to the situation than the mere fact of it, wasn't there? And she couldn't concern herself with making sure Riju was informed. She had to make sure that Riju was ready. Being confronted with this, needing to support another person, made her feel slightly dizzy. Was this what she'd been doing to Pai the entire time? Riju, she said, I cannot ask you to be calm. The goddess knows that I have spent long enough wrestling with my own fears. However, I will ask you to order your thoughts, and through that order us as a group. What is the plan for approaching Von Aboris? For a moment, just one, it seemed that Riju would balk. Then she said, Do you have bomb arrows? Plenty, Paya said. It was not just that, anticipating the needs of the day, Pai had the cruelly sharp bow of a lionel strapped to her back. However many bomb arrows they had, Von Aboris would be feeling a great deal more. Riju nodded, regained a measure of her composure. Von Aboris is most vulnerable at its feet. Using the Thunder Helm, I will be able to protect us from its attacks. A few direct hits with bomb arrows at each foot should render it immobile long enough for you to board. It should be... Very simple. Her tone said, of course, that she did not believe it would be. And, in all likelihood, she was right. Both Naruda and Farudonia should have been simple, too, but nothing about approaching them or freeing them had been simple. The complications arose only partially from the powers of the divine beasts, and only partially from the powers of the monsters that acted as guards and jailers. Far more of it was rooted in the hatred and the cruelty of the darkness that fought beneath Hyrule Castle. I am no less afraid than she is. But she is so young. Even as tested as she is. Even as much as the world has asked of her and taken from her. This may be too much. What can I do for her? When I too am swallowed by my fears. Lie, the answer came from inside of her. Lie until the lie becomes real. What can I do? The problem isn't Von Auris. The problem is Ganon. Be the strength she needs. Be the strength everyone needs. She freed you, Zelda said, in a tone that she had not used in a century, one of command, of authority, of respect. I am ready to ride with you, and hope that you will ride with me in confidence. If you protect us from the lightning, and if you shield Pius so that she can stop Navoris, she reached within herself, grabbing hold of the power. 
Golden light exploded from her skin, bathing the area around her. The sand seals ceased their barking and the storm seemed to calm, ever so slightly, as Regis stood staring with an open mouth. You can leave Ganon to me. Silence. Then. The color of Riju's soul shifted. Selva did not hear the girl praying to her ancestors. She felt that, in the power that surged from the young chief, in the answering power that came from the spirit realm, the thunder helm was like a beacon, and Riju was the flame that fed it. It flared, nearly as bright as Zelda, and all around them the wind was stilled and the sand ceased to whirl. Beyond the area of the helm's influence, the storm raged, but within it there was quiet. Mantap, the chief of the Gerudo said, and the Hylian oracle and her shake attendant obeyed. The three rode together into the storm. Von Aboris's roar filled the distance. They broke through the wall of the storm, into the eye where the air was still and the sky was clear. Von Aboris's footsteps shook the desert beneath them, sending shockwaves through the ground that sent their shields bouncing on the sand. It was not clear by what means it sensed them, but it reacted to them almost instantly, and the air shifted, howled, groaned under the strain of the power channeled through it. Stay close to me, Riju shouted. Selda could feel that she was within the area of Riju's protection, and while Pia steered her own sand seal closer to the chief she took the time to look up, to observe. A thunderbolt like Selda had never seen struck the invisible shield provided by Riju's power channeled into the thunder helm, and the lightning split and danced over the surface, forming a dome of electricity directly above them for the barest fraction of a second. If she had not been shielding herself with the power, then the brightness would have seared her retinas. The sound hit after that, so close and so explosive it could not even be called thunder, and it slammed into them like a physical wall. I jumped so hard her shield nearly slipped out from under her. All three riders had to tighten the grips on the reins of their seals. Riju shot it over her shoulder. It will be another few seconds before I can strike again. We're going to get as close as we can, as fast as we can. That should be easy, Zelda thought, since it's walking directly toward us. Patricia and the two other seals barked in excitement as they were given the rein, dashing forward with all speed. They were either nearsighted to an extreme or were perceiving Von Aboris' strain. They did not respond at all to the looming terror of force and destruction. Every footfall was like a thunderclap, and as they drew near to it, Zelda found herself craning her neck up to stare at the face of the machine. How tall are these things? A hundred meters? Mar? There was a moment where she tried to imagine the feat of engineering that was the building of these colossi, the facilities that must have been erected to manufacture even a single plate of their armor, to say nothing of the assembly, and she was swept away by a sense of awe and giddy, and yielding euphoria. We really are capable of so much, aren't we? It ready. Regis' voice rose as the air buzzed. After the next one, we're going in. The world roared. Lightning slammed into the shield again, feeding harmlessly into the sand. Nah. Riju led Patricia with an easy, practiced hand, and Payet and Zelda followed in her wake as they swept toward the slowly moving feet of Von Aboris. A single step. Zelda cut a glance at Paya, saw that she held the reins of her steed in her teeth, freeing her arms for the lionel bow and the hissing, burning arrows that she held notched. That glance became a stare. She could not look away from Paya as she pulled back the string of the inhuman weapon, and then loosed her payload. By dark magic one bomb arrow became three. All three slammed into Naboris's right forefoot. The eruption was louder than the thunder, and the divine beast roared in protest and fury as the power coursing through its right leg went out. Rija whooped loudly as the lightning struck again, her excitement turning into a peal of genuine, if frightened, laughter. Zelda had to fight down her own adrenaline-fueled reaction, yes. This felt good. Riju led the three in a wide sweep, Haya pulling hard on the reins with her neck while reading another shot. Something is wrong. What? What was it? The lightning surged again. Riju was still laughing, the power of the Thunder Helm protecting them all from the rage of the Divine Beast, which was too slow to attack them directly. It's too slow to attack anything directly. It would need a stationary target, at which point it might as well not. She saw. It stopped moving. So it was. 
one leg robbed of its power. Von Aboris had come to a complete halt, and was no longer making an attempt to address its attackers save by the relatively passive means of its lightning attacks. Solta did not have to look to understand, of course. There was only one explanation for this change in behavior, for this shift in the air, and it was as simple as sleeping, as clean as death. Still, she looked up. So did Riju and Paya. All of them saw that the divine beast seemed to be ignoring them, like a god ignoring insects. Its sights were set on a target more in keeping with the vastness of its attentions. A stationary target. Paya made a distress sound. The crest on the side of Von Aboris's had shifted, and a red targeting light painted the side of a distant wall. Gerudo Town. Weiju's shriek was almost incoherent. Credit sell to this, she did not think, then. She pulled hard on the reins of her sand seal, which broke off from the group, and hurtled toward the front of Von Aboris. Telda, stop. Paya's voice behind her. She must have wrapped the reins around one of her forearms. The power was in her and she shouted back in Hylia's voice that reverberated off of everything. Keep shooting it. The capacitors of the Divine Beast were so energy-dense that they defied Zelda's understanding of how power could be stored in the first place, if they were called divine, and it was because whatever engine drove them must have been crafted with the secrets of the gods. She could hear the whine as that energy gathered, collecting until it was a spear that could pierce the side of the calamity itself. She understood, having been near the firing of these weapons twice now, what it would sound like when it wiped an entire city from existence. An explosion behind her as Pai unleashed another volley. Von Aboris did not even roar. Those other knew with the faith of her heart and the far-reaching senses of the power that the bomb arrows had struck home. With those same senses Zelda felt the lightning before it struck the field of the Thunder Helm, was prepared when the thunder washed over her like a physical force. With those same senses Zelda felt the particles. Is lightning made of particles? Small pieces of light? What am I perceiving? Are the air beginning to shift and gather and whirl, directed by the vast and unyielding energies of the divine beast? Not aimed at Riju and Pai this time. No, it would be striking directly at her. Trying to stop her, because it knew. The sand seal out faced Von Aboris, tearing ahead of the divine beast, careening as if pursued by a predator. The wine grew to a terrible pitch. The air shifted in the moment before the lightning struck, and Zelda thrust her fist defiantly into the sky. Lightning smashed into a dome of red light, bouncing harmlessly off of Dart's protection. She felt for the next volley, to see if it was aiming for her or for Riju. There was nothing. All of Naboris's energy was focused on powering up its primary weapon. She pulled hard on the reins, and her sand seal came to a halt. She jumped off of her shield, stood on the sand, turned and looked up at the divine beast. She'd pulled perhaps a hundred and fifty meters ahead of it. It was less than four seconds from firing. I'm going to need your help again, she thought. From that boundless space where souls dwelt, a long dead champion roared in laughter and in challenge. From a distance one could see the subtle shifting in the divine beast's stance just before it fired. A third volley of bomb arrows struck at its heels, and it ignored these as it lowered its stance and tilted forward its head, bracing through a series of extending struts that reinforced the neck in relation to the torso. There was a sound, then, though it was on a level that only gods could hear clearly. A ball of golden light launched into the air. Distance did not matter, but Zelda still thought in very concrete terms. With dark strength and Mepha's aid she sailed up, oh, until she was level with the divine beast's head. Von Aboris fired. It is easy, after the scale of the Calamity's attack, to forget the power of the divine beasts. Not breakers of worlds, but breakers of mountains, dwarfed by the enemy but so far removed from the course of regular life that to the average person they might as well have been identical. A tube of light erupted from Von Aboris's face as big around as the torso of the beast itself, and the air before it was burned clean. The ball of golden light flared, brighter than Naboris's weapon, brighter than the light of day, darkening the world around it. The golden light turned a searing, roaring red, like a floating gem. The gem became a sphere. The attack struck the goddess and powered Daruk's protection. It sprayed in a wide cone, as if it were made of light, but not one stray moat reflected past the oracle who floated at the center of the maelstrom, leashing the power of the gods and using it as a block against pure destruction, against wanton death.
The sound was so loud that the thunder was like nothing, and the eruption of bomb arrows was lost to the wind. Fully draining the power of the divine beast would have taken long, long seconds. Perhaps Ganon had planned for those stretched out moments. Perhaps Zelda could have survived that, or perhaps, after nearly dying while containing and directing the power of the calamity, it would have been beyond her current capacity. There was no time to tell. The last leg of Von Avarice was deactivated. The surge in power that rushed through the frame of the beast forced it into a full system reset. Its power outputs fell to zero. The beam of light dwindled, dwindled, and was gone. A ruby sphere fell lightly to the sand below. Von Navarus went into an automatic resting posture, drawing its legs up under it and lowering its body to increase stability. Three sand seals streaked toward one another. Two riders one nearly in shock from the relief and the other grimly determined from familiarity with what was to come, waved at the third, who did not wave back. Zelda felt the darkness stirring within the divine beast. She reached out with the power of Hylia, all of it that she could muster, and as she rode for Riju and Pius she reached out across the vast, infinite space that separated one soul from another. Count the grains of sand in the desert. No, not all at once. Begin with the grains that you can hold on your fingertip. Brush them onto your palm. Fill up your palm thusly. And when you have a palmful, drop it onto the earth. Let it there rest. And for every palmful you add, you have counted that many grains. Keep counting. Keep going. Fill the desert. Fill the world. The great Urboso was not a patient woman. She had never been patient. Few were the problems she could not solve with her hands and with her words. And those problems she resented most terribly. Death had been one of those problems. Waiting had been one of those problems. She was sensitive, among the champions, to the thought and spirits of others. Perhaps not the most sensitive, but when the blight had driven his sword into her stomach and pulled upward, when the hand she'd had locked around his throat had fallen loose and darkness had fallen around her and she'd come to be chained down in this dark, lonely, cold place, she had been able to look out across the vast distances of Hyrule. The others were bound, as she had been bound. She could see each of them. Arbosa had never been patient. And, as it turned out, she did not take well to being bound, even if the chains that held her were chains of the spirit. After Dark had fallen to his vigil, after Rivali had exhausted himself, after Mephed stilled and turned her gaze toward Hyrule Castle, Arbosa still fought. Her struggle was not thoughtless, every motion, every pull, was focused and calculated and invested with as much force as she could muster. For years she pulled against the dark, testing it, feeling out its strengths, searching for weaknesses. For years more she continued, not in the hopes that continuously applied pressure would weaken it but because she had nothing else to do. She could not wait. Zelda was still out there, alive, and if Erbosa was still here then that meant that Ganon was still out there, dear. It was not fear that drove her. It was not a need to be free. It was not revenge. It was not even shame, that burning core of her that flared up every time she thought of Ganon, of how the other peoples of Hyrule quietly related the calamity to the Gerudo. Every time her strength flagged, every time her will began to slip, she would hold a phrase to her heart. She needs me. And she would find her strength again. Thalda's face stayed in the forefront of her mind, and Erbosa fought, and the firmament quaked at her resistance. She lost herself to that struggle. Hours turned to days turned to decades, and she noticed not at all. Time passed no more quickly for her, but it didn't matter. She never stopped. The hero would have nodded in appreciation, surely, if he saw how fiercely she fought from beyond the pall of death. Then, one day, a light broke through the darkness, far to the east. The binds holding Mifra in play shattered, and the Zora champion was freed. The darkness screamed, raging at the power wielded against it, but it could not stop her. Erbosa felt a stirring at that. A surety, yes. She was coming. But Erbosa did not wait. She drew into herself, focusing all of her power, gathering it into a single point for a single moment. With the same fervor that she had fought against her confinement, she prepared. She barely noticed when Dark was freed. She barely noticed anything. She focused. She held Zelda's face in her heart. Her entire soul was like a clenched fist, waiting to be thrown. Then, then, a light broke open above her. The darkness split. 
With the eyes of her soul did Abosa look up and see the golden radiance that reached down through the dark. The hand, which she had held while the princess wept. The arm, so much stronger than it had been in days past. The face, set with determination and hope. Her mother's face, all over again. Arbosa! Zelda called to her. Yes, her mother's face. For a century Arbosa had not allowed herself to dwell on that, had not let her past torment her. But now, now as she unleashed all of her strength, as lightning filled the void, as a thunderstorm erupted into existence from nothing with such ferocity that even Zelda was stunned by it. As Arbosa's binding snapped like glass, that was what went through her mind, the face of her beloved queen, and a promise she had made long ago. I will protect our daughter. She was still bound, but she reached out across the dark, and the thunder announced her. Little bird? Zelda's hand clasped with hers. Riju's information network was vast, as such networks went. She was learned, informed, in ways that the leaders of other tribes might not be. Yes, the Sheikah were probably better informed, and there was a hard limit on how much information could be fit to a collection of travelers and merchants who were all nine feet tall and stood out everywhere they went, but she knew enough, or thought that she did. Anyway, she had learned, for instance, what had happened during the attack on Varuta. The almost impossible to imagine assault on the Divine Beast, the appearance of King Dorofan on the shore of the reservoir, and the appearance of the Princess Mepha, who had flitted across the water like a ghost doing battle with the water blight personally. Though, do, had she heard, because apparently a young Goran named Junobo was very open to conversation, that the spirit of Doric had manifested to do battle with the fire blight on the back of Varudania. That the spirits of the champions had appeared was known to her. That, she assured herself, meant that she was mentally prepared for any circumstance or strangeness that should come her away. She believed that until the very moment as she came to a stop, adjusting the thunder helm, and looked at Zelda, only to realize she was not looking at the Hylian princess. Or, she was. But the Hylian girl wasn't foremost in her perceptions, as if she was occupying the same space as another person. And that person. Riju took off the thunder helm, holding it in her hands as she looked up at the towering figure of the lost chief of the Gerudo. The light of the day was behind her bow cell, throwing her silhouette into harsh relief, and the wind tugged gently at the enormous, carefully maintained mass of her hair. Arbosa looked at her and smiled. Well, Riju thought, she smiles like my mother did. Arbosa knelt, very formally, and something in Riju rebelled at the sight of it, but knew that to act on that rebellion would be a far more horrible disrespect. So, even though she wanted to ask Arbosa to get up, to offer up her own dignity in response. She didn't, she stood, as tall and imperious as she could manage, extremely aware that Abosa was still the taller as she knelt, of Pia as the warrior watched this exchange. Chief of the Gerudo, Abosa said, and her voice was smooth and deep and calming in the extreme. I have a request I would humbly put before you, if allowed. Ouija breathed in, breathed out. This was important. She had to get it right. She had to be strong as strong as the woman who was paying her deference. I will hear your request, she said. Arbosa inclined her head further. You have my most sincere thanks. Great chief, a terrible evil will soon bear down upon us. I ask that I be allowed to defend your person and the person of your companion against this threat. I should have brought the scimitar of this seven, and daybreak her. Through that panic you found calm. She nodded. You have my permission. Shall I provide you with arms? Now Urbosa lifted her head, and the turn of her mouth was clever, teasing, and something in that made Riju relax. No, great chief. I fear I must make a more presumptuous request that I be allowed to borrow the Thunderhelm. When last I faced this evil, I wanted dearly for the protection of our ancestors. Far, far in the distance, from the back of Von Naboris, a howl rose. It was like the howling of a sandstorm, save that it cracked like a voice finding itself for the first time. There was malice in that howl. Riju had to fight the urge to just throw the thunder helm at Urbosa, to beg her to take it. She could hear the evil of Ganon crawling along the back of the divine beast, preparing to leap, even across this distance, and urging her to hurry. But she would not hurry. The chief of the Gerudo did not hurry, when she could help it, 
and she genuinely believed that she had enough time. So she stopped, pretending to consider this request. Then, she held the thunder helm out. The weight seemed enormous with her arms extended. Erbosa took the relic in her carefully maintained hands, and it looked surnatural as she turned it between her fingers. The howl in the distance cut off. A black thunderbolt streaked into the air, tracing a jagged line of darkness through the sky, cutting the blue into sections delineated by a hissing void. The thunderbolt streaked toward them, crossing the distance of a kilometer in the space of mere heartbeats. Erbosa placed the thunder helm on her head. The howling death cut through the air, and Riju thought she caught the impression of a sword as it swung for Erbosa. Riju was knocked onto her back by a wave of force, and then she heard the thunder clap. For a few brief moments she was so dazed she could do nothing but observe. The blade was shaped like a person, like a man, she corrected herself, with a cape of fire hanging from its shoulders. It was of size with a Gerudo, and in its hands it held two curved blades, like scimitars the size of great swords. Its body was layered in armor like that of the guardians, and his face was a flat plane with a single red, glass eye staring out of its center. Red hair rose behind it, waving in the breeze. The creature hesitated. Lightning. It didn't expect the lightning. Kai was in front of Riju, standing between her and the spawn of Ganon, sword and shield in her hands. Urbosa rose to her feet, turned to face the blight. The blight howled again, and Riju covered her ears to protect against the shriek. The great Urbosa clenched her fist, and lightning danced between her fingers. End of chapter.